Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, special Flash webinar. Well, we'll go over the leadership, leadership succession uh, currently taking place in Japan, uh, where Yoshihide Suga has emerged as a front runner to replace outgoing Prime Minister Shinzo Abe as Prime Minister of the Liberal Democratic Party, which also makes him the new Prime Minister. As we wait for uh, attendees to stream in, um, you are very welcome to send uh, questions for our speakers using the Q&A button on your screen. Uh, please do not reshare or reproduce the contents of this webinar without permission. Uh, we will have a recording of this webinar available on the registration page afterwards. Uh, let's give it a few more minutes for uh, some more attendees uh, to come in. In the meantime, I'm very happy to be joined by a very special panel of insight providers, including uh, Mio Kato, Scott Foster, and Travis Lundy. And we're also waiting for Campbell Gunn to come in in just a minute. Uh, gentlemen, welcome. Let's uh, get right to it. Um, yep. Obviously, the current state of things uh, stems from Shinzo Abe's uh, abrupt resignation due to health problems. Um, so Mr. Suga is the current chief uh, cabinet secretary in Mr. Abe's administration. Uh, he's been a part of uh, the prime minister's inner circle for, uh, for the last few years. So I would like us to first get a better idea of Mr. Suga. Uh, what is his background and, and sort of what does he bring to the table? Okay. Can I, can I start as um, I've written most on the background? Um, Suga is quite, ex Please do. Uh, Suga is quite unusual uh, for a Japanese politician in that he's very much his own man. Um, he has no hereditary uh, background. Many Japanese politicians uh, inherit uh, the seats, sorry, I need to get in view, inherit the seats that they hold. Um, a good example being um, the son of uh, Suga's mentor, uh, Kaji Yamasan, who was also chief cabinet secretary in the past. Um, his son is inherited his father's seat and is currently the trade minister. Um, the other aspect is that Suga has few followers, uh, and few, few people that would necessarily view him as a mentor. Um, and therefore his ideal role uh, has been behind the scenes. And it is his loyalty to Abe that has kept him in this position for eight years. It is also the fact that he's extremely good at dealing with um, the scandals. There's a four letter word I could use here that he's cleaned up for Mr. Abe. And therefore he knows where an awful lot of skeletons uh, are actually buried. Uh, this has made him uh, extremely good at dealing with a bureaucracy, extremely good at dealing with other uh, factions and politicians. And also, he's become a consummate liar, um, which is a, is, a, is a very good trait in a politician. The flip side of that is actually because he is the chief cabinet secretary, he has a pretty much guaranteed slot on nationwide television almost every day um, as the communicator of government policy. Um, and his press conferences are up on the Kante website, the, um, uh, the cabinet uh, website. But he has, I think, a higher profile in the ordinary Japanese household than any other politician in Japan other than Abe. Um, despite the fact that he has a very low key approach, uh, he is totally uncharismatic as one of the better comb overs I have seen um, in a while. Um, and his, um, his most prominent role came when Japan uh, changed its emperor and therefore changed its era name. Um, and it was Suga that uh, held up the characters Rewa um, and therefore the, those words and the era name are pretty much uh, uh, indelibly linked to him. Um, in his politics, um, he has been a bit of a maverick. Uh, as I mentioned in my note, um, shortly after being elected, 
um, and out of loyalty to his mentor Kajiyama. Um, both of them were members of the Obuchi faction and Obuchi at that time in 1998 was standing for prime minister. And to many people's shock and surprise, although not to Suga's because he said he was doing the right thing, he supported his mentor Kajiyama in Kajiyama's failed bid to become prime minister. As a result, both of them had to leave the Obuchi faction and were denied roles in the Obuchi government. It was Koizumi, another maverick PM, that brought him back into government. And pretty much since then, because of his effectiveness in carrying out his, his duties, um, he's been one of the more consistent members of, uh, of Japanese cabinets over the years. Um, another important point to uh, take note of is that in the last five months or so, it appears, and this has not been confirmed broadly, but he did have some form of falling out with Abe. Um, and it, it was um, rumored that um, Abe therefore <clears throat> was unlikely to anoint him um, as, as his successor. Obviously events in the case of Abe's bowels have intervened and um, now he is clearly, because of a want of viable alternatives, um, the sensible candidate given the circumstances we are in with COVID um, and, and other difficulties. Abe, um, despite his charisma and global standing, has been unable to promote or uh, mentor any viable successor. Um, I don't think he actually ever thought that Suga would be his successor. And I, and I think the fact that they fell out was when Suga did actually make it clear that that was his goal. Um, there have been a variety of uh, very ineffectual, um, but mostly right-wing orientated um, Abe friends uh, who've had ministerial roles, most of whom have failed in those roles, the most prominent being a lady called Inada, uh, who was briefly defense minister and made an absolute hash of that. So um, given that there's actually a political vacuum in Japan and Japan sorely needs stability, um, Suga's skills, uh, which are primarily uh, organizational, um, are, are in demand. It will be interesting to see to what extent uh, there will be any, uh, I mean, his for the formation of his cabinet will be very important and to what extent he's able to build a collective form of government, which was clearly not the case under Abe, which was much more a presidential style of government. And it's because of this and his, his nature, hardworking, um, willing to sacrifice. Uh, he, he hasn't been at home. His home is in Kanagawa, which is in the neighboring prefecture to Tokyo. He hasn't lived at home for the last eight years. Maybe his wife thinks that's a good thing. Um, he worked his way through university by taking a job in a cardboard factory. Um, when he was a schoolboy, he actually lived in a boarding house next to the school during the winter because it was easier to get there through the snow than from home. So this is a man who's known hardship throughout his life but has responded through diligence. And although I think the external relations may suffer because he's not going to have the rapport that Abe has with Trump and other world leaders, his domestic policy initiatives may actually be very positive. And as I mentioned in the note, the extremely popular with high earning uh, um, investment bankers in Tokyo, um, the uh, return, return money to your hometown and get a tax break policy was um, Suga's idea. I expect other such initiatives, all of which will be aimed at uh, revitalizing the regions, uh, revitalizing, as Scott was mentioning in his comment, smaller companies, and not necessarily favoring big business um, or the established elites or entrenched vested interests. So I think he's the most interesting Japanese politician to have come along and achieve the possibility of becoming prime minister since Koizumi. 
Um, and I, that's why I view this as a positive for the economy and for the stock market, all other things being equal, um, because this man has a mission and um, clearly he does not want to make this a short-term premiership nor retire um, without achieving much. Now, Abe's long-held dream of changing the constitution um, which did not have the support of the majority of the Japanese people, nor did it have the support of the previous emperor, and I would probably dare to say the current emperor, is now clearly dead, which is a good thing because the legislative agenda will be entirely focused on um, economic revival. Um, I think um, foreign policy will take a second um, a backstage or second level priority. And I think it would be clever of um, Suga to reappoint Kono, who is the most internationally uh, outlooking and certainly most fluent English Japanese politician, despite again his slight maverick status, to the role of foreign minister and act as a team uh, where Kono can make up for Suga's deficiencies, not just in English, but in. Uh, a desire and knowledge to uh, glad uh, to do glad-handed trips around the world, which Abe did more than any other Japanese prime minister. In, I think that's in interesting. My memory. Um, I think so that's, that's interesting. Since, yeah. Thank you for thank you for that, Campbell. Uh, I I just wanted to uh, say that this this is interesting because uh, some say that uh, Mr. Suga will be the sort of continuity prime minister. Uh, especially because of his close relationship to, uh, uh, to Mr. Abe. Uh, but it does seem like he is a very different character, a very different person and politician. Um, and it, I don't think it's reasonable to expect that he will just, uh, it will just be business as usual uh, under his premiership. Would that be accurate? I think, I think so. it will be, I think it will be business better than before, carried out better than before. Um, and his agenda will wholly be focused on uh, the, the improving the lot of Japanese citizens. And therefore, Abe's global Japan and uh, constitutional revision uh, will take a back seat. And I think both of those are good things for the economy and the stock market. And I think we should add that uh, Abe uh, has... Uh, caused or been involved in a few scandals uh, which uh, from outside seem quite petty um, but have wasted a lot of time and effort and as Campbell mentioned uh, Mr. Suga uh, had to smooth those over. Uh, it's very difficult to imagine Suga himself getting involved in that kind of scandal, uh, the, uh, the school scandal um, <clears throat> and the others, you'll probably be very, very serious and pay close attention to policy initiatives at all times and not go off on any tangents. Uh, I think also uh, that we shouldn't exaggerate uh, any reported falling out between Abe and Suga. Uh, Suga, uh, like Abe, emerged from the Koizumi administration and it was Suga uh, who pushed Abe to make a comeback after his first prime ministership failed. So Suga has been beside and behind Abe for many, many years. Uh, there are a few policy differences. Uh, perhaps the most salient of these recently has been uh, that uh, Suga uh, apparently wants to make a, a stronger and what at least more prominent effort uh, to contain COVID-19. Uh, which uh, uh, Abe has, uh, in the view of the Japanese people, uh, not dealt with with sufficient seriousness. Uh, so we'll, we'll probably see something along those lines right away. And then again, as Campbell mentioned, uh, Suga places importance on the average person, and that includes their spending ability. Uh, if you recall, um, Abe uh, himself uh, was trying to jawbone corporate leaders into raising wages uh, by higher percentages than they were uh, than they were interested in. 
so Abe, of course, is, is viewed as a right winger, but he's not a right winger in the Western sense. Uh, he's, uh, he's always wanted to, to push consumer spending, and that means to get some of the money out of uh, corporate uh, bank accounts and into the pockets of workers. Uh, and then the, the final thing um, is Suga's ability to get along with just about anyone uh, and, uh, and pull the right strings to keep the political machine functioning. In all the debate and, and essay writing concerning the succession, I have seen very little, uh, or perhaps nothing at all, uh, concerning the alliance between the Liberal Democratic Party, the LDP, and Cometo. Cometo, yeah. um, uh, as you may know, uh, is a more like small shopkeeper uh, party, um, lower middle class party with a religious affiliation. And it's a party that has, um, I believe, like no equivalent in other countries. And therefore it is not, uh, not sufficiently analyzed or uh, uh, the awareness of this party is not sufficient in, in the global analysis of Japanese politics. But without the alliance with Komeito, Abe would not have had the huge majorities that enabled him to push through his policies. And the same thing will go for Suga. Uh, I think compared with uh, the other candidates and particularly Ishiba, uh, Suga will find it easier to get along with Komeito. Uh, but from an electoral standpoint, and uh, in particular winning uh, the next election uh, a year or so from now, uh, the alliance with Komeito will remain vital. Uh, I'd like to add something uh, to uh, what Campbell said uh, with regard to the the attention uh, that uh, I think Yoshihide Suga will apply to um, uh, policy targets. Um, the the one thing which which a lot of people don't know about uh, Japan and uh, the the role of chief cabinet secretary is chief cabinet secretary is is more important than deputy prime minister. Chief, Chief cabinet secretary is the man. Um, uh, for, for, for the longest period, uh, the, the cabinet secretary was basically like a, well, a secretary. Uh, but uh, in the 70s and 80s, it became a more powerful thing. And in, in 2001, uh, the rules changed. And uh, the cabinet secretary got, uh, cabinet secretariat or the cabinet office became a much bigger thing. Uh, bigger staff, bigger budget. Um, uh, this year, the budget for the for just the cabinet secretariat is 165 billion yen, a billion and a half dollars. Uh, they also have a a policy budget uh, uh, in the cabinet office of this year uh, something like 4.4 trillion yen. Now, that's not that they go spend on themselves. That's something which it is basically the uh, the budget which is applied to the administration's uh, chief policy aims. Um, that would include, for example, after the 2011 earthquake, uh, that included uh, money dispersed uh, quickly to uh, various local governments and various agencies to uh, address uh, the needs of people who had uh, lost their homes or, or businesses. Um, uh, the, the really, really big um, part of that budget, and it's a huge increase this year uh, from last year, um, is uh, in support measures for children. So that the Abe, um, one of the arrows, the third arrow included measures to, um, uh, to provide daycare centers and, and uh, whatnot so that more women could re-enter the workforce um, uh, to address the, the lack of, of growth of the workforce. Uh, that's, that's a relatively large budget. Uh, last year it was uh, $28 billion. This year it's 35. Um, it's, it's a big piece of that $44 billion or $40, $42 billion budget this year. Um, other smaller bits are, are things like um, uh, aid to uh, aid and support to Okinawa uh, uh, because of the, uh, the, kind of sustained lower uh, spending by the defense uh, agency and by the U.S. military in Okinawa. Um, 
there are there's a budget for a uh, billion dollars for uh, regional revitalization, um, which is really uh, meant to uh, provide the the backbone for other funds to come in and support regional re revitalization. Um, Campbell's comment that it's it's for um, regional um, areas, support for regional areas, I think is 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 completely. Um, uh, right. Uh, if you look at um, the efforts, the 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 effort at lowering telephone bills, which is really a Suga kind of trademark at this point, um, it, it is really his own personal soapbox that he's standing on. Um, one of the things about that is that um, in rural areas, the 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 um, the cost of telephone uh, as it was regulated was a relatively high portion of a, a family's monthly income. Farmers don't make a lot of money. And uh, the traditional farm policy was to have uh, very small uh, farms and to keep the, uh, the price of rice elevated so that a farmer could actually live off of a very small plot of land. Um, but even then, it's still not a lot of money. Costs aren't high, but it's just not a lot of money. And uh, so having a phone bill every month of 4,000 yen or 5,000 yen is, well, a lot. It's, it's a lot of money. Um, and so uh, traditionally, that phone bill has been seen as a monopoly cost where NTT uh, exerted a high cost. You had to pay 72,000 yen fixed price to buy a telephone line. Uh, and then you had to pay the monthly fee, whatever it was. Um, Eventually that ended, but you never got your 72,000 yen back and thus you gave it up uh, and, and got the refund. Uh, and most people didn't. Uh, and now people carry that with multiple phones. So three or four phones per household, it ends up being somewhat expensive. Uh, he sees if he can lower that, then that'll be basically 1% in the pockets of an enormous number of people. Japan has a relatively flat um, income structure. Um, in that there are a very large number of people who are um, above the poverty line, but not enormously above the poverty line. Uh, if, if you were to think about this in Tokyo terms, in regional terms, it's a, it's a fair bit better, but um, in the background of Scott's picture, there are some nice farmhouses there, but those are the rich people. There are a lot of people who are not rich in regions. Um, what you can see uh, also is that there's a, uh, uh, there's an effort at the FSA um, to promote uh, uh, deregulation, I will call it, uh, because currently there's a regulation about how, or up until now, there's been a regulation about how regional banks may operate. Uh, and there was one main regional bank per prefecture, and then there was a secondary regional bank per prefecture, and then there were credit unions, agricultural cooperative unions, etc. cetera. Um, which all act as deposit takers, savers, lenders. Uh, uh, the problem is that there are now too many branch offices and too many um, entities which support back offices, which support um, staff. And that just ends up being a relatively high cost uh, of brick and mortar and employment to support what is basically a zero interest rate, zero net interest earning um, uh, sector of the economy. Um, there's been an effort by both Suga-san and by uh, the, the, the most recent commissioner of the FSA, Toshihide Endo, who's kind of nearing the end of his term here, uh, to, uh, to change the way uh, regional banking works. Uh, and this dates back to um, uh, Suga-san's emphasis uh, on supporting Kajiyama-san. One of Kajiyama-san's main pillars uh, back in the late 90s was that he wanted to reduce the number of banks in Japan. Uh, at that time, there were something like 11 or 12 uh, major uh, money center banks. Uh, and uh, he thought that should become three or four. Uh, that by itself was actually um, uh, a stated... A stated uh, kind of outcome of the way things were going to, were going to end up uh, by a, a relative well-known banks analyst named David Atkinson, 
who worked at Goldman's uh, Solomon and Goldman Sachs, uh, and then uh, I guess he retired 15 years ago. Um, he's still in Japan. He's still in Japan. Interestingly, uh, he is now a policy advisor himself to uh, Sugasan, uh, and has advised uh, Sugasan on um, improving the lives of regional Japan by. Uh, increasing inbound tourism by increasing uh, uh, the promotion of cultural activities, uh, cultural monuments, etc., uh, which helps because, in fact, David Atkinson's uh, uh, day job is as CEO of a business which uh, um, is in which is in the business of, of repairing shrines and, and, and temples. Um, but he, he has. He has, uh, David Atkinson was, was a, a young guy when he said basically that the, the whole banking system was going to blow up in the early 90s. Uh, and the FSA wanted to get rid of him. Uh, everybody wanted to get rid of him. He actually, Sugasan and Kajimasan actually listened to him and listened to the whole concept that banking needed to reform. Uh, it's, as to the idea of this being business as usual, uh, I believe that's where it continues. Uh, Sugasan does need the political support of the people around him because he, as Campbell said, he doesn't have a faction. Um, what he does have is he has a, a huge awareness of where the bodies are buried, both scandal uh, and also policy. Um, the, the, the cabinet office is really the way that the administration uh, understands, acquires information, distributes information, uh, and, um, and exerts um, its policy. So basically the prime minister uh, now has a giant army at his disposal to go get all the information from all of the uh, cabinet uh, offices uh, and, and, and departments and uh, to make use of it the best way they can. Um, I don't think that, uh, I, I don't view Sugasan as being someone who is keen on deregulation per se. I think he is keen on re-regulation. Uh, he's, I think he would like reform of regulation. I think where he sees that the government can play a very strong role in redirecting the way the economy works, that's what he does. Um, I see no lack of confidence in Sugasan. Uh, historically, he's he's done interviews where he has been very clear that he takes in information, he talks to different people, and then he makes a decision. And he makes the decision for the Japanese people in the right way that will serve the Japanese people. He's perfectly happy to be an autocrat. Um, he just wants to get it done the right way. Uh, I agree with Campbell that this is something which helps um, the, uh, the average man on the street. Uh, it certainly does not help the K-Don men and it does not help listed companies. Um, the, the dark horse will be uh, whether he can um, attract a kind of a, a popularity. As Campbell mentioned, he's the guy on the TV, right? Uh, he's the guy who speaks to reporters and speaks to everybody, takes questions and answers them He's the strong face of the administration for eight years now. If he can turn that into um, respect, that the people around Japan or across Japan respect him for what he's doing, uh, rather than his charisma that Koizumi had, that could be a really powerful thing. Um, and I don't dismiss the concept that he could become a popular leader. Uh, because of the way that he is professional and non-corrupt and he is not pandering to a local um, uh, demography. Um, and, and that, this idea of doing the right thing, I think is something which will probably resonate uh, reasonably well among the populace if he can actually portray that. Uh, his, the, the biggest risk that I think he faces uh, going forward is the fact that he would actually, if prime, if he becomes prime minister, as I assume he will, uh, it will be the fact that he won't be in front of the people and able to, to give his grand view um, as easily 
because he will be protected by his own cabinet secretary and by um, other people who will then um, kind of face downward. That, that could end up being his biggest risk. Who might that be? I don't know. If he wants to stay loyal to the Abe Koizumi concept, uh, you could imagine it would be somebody like Amari, but I don't think that... Um, I, I, put, I put my money on Kajiyama Hiroshi. The young guy, all right. Yep. He's yep. Um, younger, significantly younger. He's, he was born in the 50s, I think. Um, yep. And there is a, an extraordinary bond between the two of them because of the link through the father. Through the father, right. And he's currently in the he's currently a member of the yeah, cabinet. But cabinet it, would, yes. it wouldn't be a, and I don't think it would be viewed as a demotion to go from Meti to, to to chief cabinet secretary. I think it's a promotion. absolutely not. It's a promotion. Yes. As I said, the, the chief cabinet the, the chief cabinet secretary has the view on everything which goes on in the government, um, and really has the the ability to make policy by by uh, rallying or corralling uh, the various bureaucracies and their uh, ability to effect change and, and receive lobbying and then kind of massage it. Um, it's a way to, um, it's a way to uh, bridge the gap between um, external policy pressures like from K Don Ren or, or, or otherwise uh, and the ministries themselves and the political uh, agenda. Um, it's one, for example, that when the health ministry pushed back on the liberalization of OTC drug sales in 2013, as one of the things where um, uh, there simply wasn't a politician at the health ministry uh, or ministry of health and labor, uh, uh, labor and uh, health, who could um, who could exert downward pressure on the technocracy and the technocracy itself was beholden to the various medical associations which didn't want um, reform to come. Uh, the one thing about the as the cabinet office becomes stronger that that allows more kind of overall administrative pressure downward into the ministries uh, by uh, getting external pressures in in the right way. I've spoken too long, I'll leave it to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> Thank I'll you, just, Travis. I'll just chip in very quickly. So um, I think Travis, Scott, and Campbell have a much better grasp of um, the overall political situation. But I'll just make a quick point on the telcos, and then I actually have a question for them in terms of labor market deregulation. Um, so on the telcos, what I'd highlight is I think um, since the news about Suga um, came out, um, I think Rakuten has outperformed and we've seen um, the other three telcos sell off. Um, what I'd flag is I think um, the Nikkei came out essentially saying that the government would probably be supportive of Rakuten in terms of trying to increase their market share just to um, increase competition in the industry. Um, so I would say that even though you've technically had competition between Docomo, KDDI and SoftBank, um, it looks to me like essentially Docomo was allowing the other two players to slowly take market share, essentially to show that it wasn't exerting monopoly power without necessarily competing too hard. Um, and this has resulted in a situation where I think all three telcos generate pretty healthy margins and have big cash calls from those operations. I think Rakuten's um, philosophy and attitude towards this is completely different. I think they look at um, their position and their entry um, using geo as uh, geo in India as an example and something to follow. So I think that um, while they're probably not as well funded, I think they are going to be quite aggressive. And if the government is supportive of their initiatives, um, I think that there is significant downside risk for um, pricing for the telcos. Um, I think Suga had a comment out that, um, you know, mobile rates could be 40% lower. Um, and that might be a bit aggressive, but as a benchmark for the worst case scenario, I, now I don't think that's too bad. Um, so I do think investors should be very, very careful in terms of looking at um, the three telcos and also be watching for rock then to potentially accelerate 
um, some of its rollouts um, with potentially a soft hand for the government in terms of whatever regulatory clearances and anything else that they need. Um, the question I actually had for Campbell, Scott, and Travis is actually what they think could change in terms of labor market reform. Because I think that was one of the big disappointments of the Abe administration in terms of them talking a big game, but really not delivering anything of substance. Um, so given that Sunga is quite a different character and he seems sort of more intent on doing the right thing, but also being more um, sort of friendly towards the working man. Um, there's a bit of a, um, a dichotomy there, I guess. And I'm just curious how they think things will play out. Scott, do you want to go first? No, why don't you? I'm just talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you did mention the idea of raising the minimum wage, um, which is one one possibility. Uh, I think greater ability to transition uh, from one company to another and from one region to another, assisted by the government, um, and particularly out from Tokyo into the regions. Um, and given that he did make that uh, policy of um, having rich Tokyo taxpayers subsidize local, um, <clears throat> local towns, I think incentives for people to return to uh, the regions and to form companies would be one idea. None of this is terribly easy, but I think he will attempt to create some um, superficially attractive, but probably in the end, meaningful policies. Um, I do think he might even attempt some moves, real moves towards a gender pay equality. Um, but these are measures for 2021. Um, the rest of this year will be taken up with COVID-19 relief. Um, and I think there will be much more, I mean, bear in mind that the 100,000 yen per household was not Abe's idea. And uh, harking back to what Scott mentioned about Kometo, the head of Kometo um, threatened to um, annul the coalition unless that was put through. Um, the second measure they came up with was the uh, travel subsidy program, which then had to be unwound and people in Tokyo who'd already booked trips had to be compensated for trips they didn't in the end take, means that a lot more thinking has to go uh, into whatever short-term measures and long-term measures actually occur. But um, without being too specific, I think there is a better chance of this type of reform under Tsuga than any other previous or potential uh, other candidate for the prime ministership. And given that I expect Suga to be um, prime minister for a second term, i.e. he will be re-elected at the next general election, uh, that gives him until the age of 76, 77, which is not old in Japanese politics because the current deputy prime minister is 78 um, to, to make a mark. But the key will be who will then follow on and to what extent the LDP's factional political system uh, has changed because um, ironically, the hereditary politician Koizumi Jr. is always thought to be the one after next. Um, so those, those would be my general ideas. I think he will attempt something, whether it will be effective, I don't know. Well, I think uh, you're onto something here because uh, assuming he wants to do this, uh, he's moving in line uh, with the development of the economy. Uh, already uh, companies, well, people first, and then companies are starting to move out of Tokyo because of COVID-19. Uh, the news the other day was Recruit moving to uh, its headquarters to uh, Wajishima, you know, off um, Osaka, the island off Osaka, because the, the, the boss is from there. Uh, this can uh, continue. Of course, it's a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, but uh, relocating uh, and not needing to have and not wanting to have large offices in Tokyo, 
uh, facilitates uh, rebuilding the economies of the regions. Uh, Suga is also an advocate of bringing those businesses back from China uh, that it makes sense to bring back, such as uh, medical equipment and uh, things like masks. Uh, and that, uh, of course, would help the regions because the new factories would, be, would not be built in Tokyo or Osaka. Um, as for uh, supporting the, the working man, uh, he's on record uh, as wanting to, to do that. And that began with the Abe administration. And if you read the, uh, the statements of the various candidates, uh, it, it appears that there is going to be a great deal of continuity from Abe to Suga. Uh, and uh, the more in, we take that as, as uh, for granted and then look for the interesting niches. I think Neil's comment about uh, telecommunications charges uh, that also becomes more important as people work from home. You know, already uh, there's uh, talk of companies shifting their financial support for employees from, uh, from train passes uh, to uh, paying their telecom bills. And, and that can only increase. Uh, so we, we seem to have an alignment between the, the, the policy goals of Mr. Suga and the trends in the economy. Uh, to add a, so a little bit on to the labor reform. Are, uh, some of the, sorry. Uh, to add sure. a little bit on to the labor reform, um, one of the things which has been um, in the back of Suga-san's uh, uh, appointments uh, in some of the back of his comments uh, has has really been about this this uh, desire to see uh, people from Tokyo help um, uh, revitalize regions uh, the the emptying out of uh, regional economies uh, is something which he is is very clearly aware of and very clearly attuned to. He originally comes from uh, the north of Japan, uh, Akita Prefecture, which is, uh, well, frankly, Akita was never that full, um, but um, it is, uh, it is uh, uh, a region which fully represents the trend of seeing young people leave uh, the place where there's little opportunity and go to the big city where there's much more opportunity. Uh, if you look at, um, some of the interesting policies uh, that you've seen during the Abe administration and, and, and also the Koizumi administration before, um, uh, a lot of it has been uh, to change the nature of government and make government more mm, economically minded. Um, and rather than be have government be a tool of business uh, and a tool of autocratic decision making, there's, there's been an openness to understanding how government must change with the times. Uh, so uh, there have been uh, changes, there have been a lot of mergers between regional governments, that is to say towns have merged with each other in order to, um, to uh, change the uh, level of staffing of, uh, of the government, uh, the local government which administers uh, uh, that region. Um, there have been big cities, there have been small cities, uh, there have been, uh, 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 Sugasan himself was, uh, was, I think, the Ministry of uh, Privatization for the post uh, back in 2006, uh, when the initial effort was made. Uh, he's done a number of things like that. He's been uh, key with uh, Endosan and his predecessor at the FSA as commissioner of the FSA to try and get um, regional bank mergers uh, effected so that the regional banks have less back office and more uh, margin with which to go do other things. Uh, one of the recent changes in the FSA uh, in, in the rules for uh, Japanese banks is that the FSA now has the ability to go instruct regional banks to change their businesses. Uh, it used to be that if you, if you ran into a capital deficiency or you lost money a certain number of years in the row, then you had to, you had to file a report with uh, the FSA and uh, undertake a reconstruction plan. Now the FSA can just step in and say, your business is not viable 
even though you've got enough capital, your business is not viable as it is. Your business model doesn't work. So I'm going to help you change it. Uh, and one of the things I think that the government uh, would like to see is they'd like to see um, the, the regional banks uh, become more professional. That means bringing in outside talent at management. Uh, Endosan has been clear. That's something they should do. Uh, if, it, if it means uh, changing the business model to effectively become consultants, i.e. Uh, they would help uh, regional companies figure out how to make more money, how to expand beyond their region, how to export more, et cetera, uh, providing um, knowledge and finance and even equity because regional banks have the ability to invest in their, in their clients the way that central banks, uh, cent uh, money center banks don't. Um, and I think there's a, uh, there's a fair bit of, uh, desire to see, um, more professionalism applied to the role of government, do the rational thing, do the right thing, find out what the right thing is, and then go do it rather than stick to the existing rules. But, um, uh, as I mentioned, it's where the government has the ability to apply power that's where you're going to see pricing pressure. And in his pet peeve has been telecom. I could imagine other places. Um, it's obviously been the case in banks where the FSA has, um, uh, in, uh, in the Abe administration, the FSA has made it clear to the money center banks that they need to cut staff, automate more, cut staff, reduce costs, reduce spreads. Um, I think that the, um, where the government has the ability to apply pressure, it will apply pressure under Sugasan. And the question is whether or not that's going to uh, enable, I mean, Mio mentioned that uh, this, the downward pressure on telecom fees could be significant for the three majors. Um, I would agree, but at the same time, uh, I would expect uh, the three majors to try and figure out a way to compete with Rakuten on that geo model. They already have the infrastructure um, and they already have the client base. If they can't monetize that client base, then that's their problem. So we're almost, uh, we're almost coming up on time. Um, so I kind of wanted to close um, perhaps with uh, some thoughts from you on uh, what should investors uh, take from this? Um, how should they expect to um, the, the market to um, develop under Mr. Suga's premiership? Uh, I'll start the one minute. Okay, you uh, got, the, you got uh, the the one minute uh, 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 summary here. Uh, where the government can improve the lives of of uh, uh, the average man, uh, they will try to do so. Uh, there will be government support for spending. I totally agree with Campbell that they, the concept of global Japan and foreign policy and Japan's place in the world as a leader, um, that will take a, a backseat. Uh, there will be much more of an effort to, uh, as Sugasan sees it, flatten the economy, even though it's a relatively flat economy already. Uh, one of his mottos for Japan is that it's a uh, Japan, a, a nation, any nation, in, and specifically Japan, should um, be a country where you 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 help yourself, uh, you help others, and you help society. Um, and it's very much of a of a very much not a right wing uh, libertarian uh, free markets uh, kind of thing. It's free markets as long as it helps. The, the average man. So anything where the government uh, effectively provides uh, a system of regulatory capture uh, for uh, companies, expect that to end. Or no, no, expect there to be pressure. It won't end, nothing ever ends, but expect there to be pressure. Yeah, I think um, generally it's <clears throat> positive for SMEs, smaller listed companies, regional oriented businesses, and less good for um, rent, uh, rent seeking conglomerates. Um, those with the highest margins 
that are domestically orientated will not see them rise significantly. Um, and those companies that are seen to be doing the right thing, which will become Mr. Suga's mantra, um, will be well rewarded. But I think we should also be careful about um, the possibility that he might do things like raise capital gains tax, um, end the Bank of Japan's um, monetary policy to infinity. Um, the term of the current go governor of the Bank of Japan, Kuroda, is up in 2023. Um, I don't think the current policies will continue beyond that. Um, and therefore, it will be um, less of a general up uh, feeling of um, <clears throat> euphoria such as we had with Abenomics. He really last for two years and was all currency driven and much more policy specific, uh, which is good for analysis um, and, and good for individual specific stock ideas. Um, I, I'm generally bullish because I think Japan's focus should be internal and not external. Um, and although the market is overvalued based on current earnings, I think the idea that overall Japanese corporate earnings will recover sooner rather than later um, is, is, I'm stronger in that belief. However, it means that the outsized outsized gains that a certain sectors have had and outsized margins and this specifically telcos and banks banks as a sector are the highest margin earning uh, sector in the economy despite their troubles um, which means that what mr son did to, son did to reduce his stake in softbank corporation makes a hell of a lot of sense to me yeah, I think uh, uh, it's important to keep in mind that Suga uh, is basically in agreement with Kuroda at the Bank of Japan, and he doesn't want to see the yen uh, follow its natural inclination to rise and rise. Uh, they will work together to keep the yen under control and probably at, uh, stable in the same range that it's been trading in for the last few years. Uh, 2023 is a long, long time away. Uh, so for, for now, uh, the situation be, should be stable. Uh, continuing uh, monetary policy with a close eye on the exchange rate and what's going on in other countries and the need to keep uh, Japan afloat uh, through this recession. Uh, and on the other hand, probably less fiscal uh, stimulus. Um, and that, I think, is positive uh, for uh, the markets. I agree with both Travis and Campbell. And the last comment I wanted to make here on markets was that um, because of their, um, their strong desire to see um, regional and small businesses uh, flourish uh, and, and the... Uh, I think the constant regard for um, improving uh, efficiency in companies and allowing uh, the government to promote the improvement of efficiency in companies. Where Campbell mentioned the increase of the capital gains tax, I could imagine um, a measure which would allow smaller companies to uh, see mergers and changes of control without incurring those excess capital gains, so as to use the fiscal policy to uh, effectively make business owners incentivized to uh, do the right thing for their communities, for their employees, et cetera, uh, and for their companies. Um, and I think that with the aging of, ob obvious aging of Japan, the obvious aging of, 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 uh, uh, of business owners and uh, their children have moved to the uh, to the urban areas, uh, my gut says that there will be some kind of fiscal measure to promote uh, or to further promote, because there already are first fiscal measures here, accounting and tax, um, to promote the further um, uh, 
uh, consolidation of SMEs, of uh, existing small listed companies. And in fact, the TSE's own uh, market structure realignment efforts uh, to change the, the nature of the TSE 1, TSE 2, JASDAQ, and Mother's uh, market structure uh, itself, I think, will lend itself to a number of, uh, or a vast number of potential mergers and consolidations among small listed companies. It's a small area to play in, but uh, my gut says that uh, just as a, as a macro thematic, I might rather be long an average weighted index than a cap weighted index right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. I just go back to the telcos um, and just um, on the long side, I think one of the things that has been fresh in Rockton stock is just the worries about the losses on the mobile side. Um, but I think given what's happened, it's likely that um, what the government can do to ensure their long-term success, they probably will do. So I think concerns on that side will probably be lower going forward. Um, on the other hand, as Campbell mentioned, with SoftBank Group reducing their stake in SoftBank Corp, um, I think that poses huge risks for SoftBank. Bank Corp's dividend, because one of the reasons they had to keep it so high was to supply the parent company with cash to pay off a lot of their debt. Um, so if that need goes down and then you have a lot of pressure on pricing from the government, I think there's huge risk of the dividend being cut, um, not necessarily over the next few months, but I think that is a risk that will come through at some point. Um, and going to Travis's point on um, M&A and consolidation among SMEs, um, I think Plays on founder succession um, should probably get another look. Um, I've written on a company called Iwatani, which essentially rolls up regional LPG distributors. Um, so companies like that, which essentially consolidate um, very small scale businesses that um, don't have the ability to sort of pass on the business to kids or something like that, I think if there are initiatives to help develop the regions and also to ensure continuity of businesses like that, I think those players would be um, in a position to do well. Um, so I think those are two sort of very um, actionable areas that investors should probably look at. Well, that should uh, about do it for uh, this session. Thank Thank you very much, gentlemen, for sharing your time and your insights. Uh, if uh, any in the audience have uh, further questions for our speakers, please feel free to email research at smartkarma.com or reach out to your Smart Karma account manager. Uh, with that, I will let you gentlemen go. Thank you very much once again. Thank you for hosting. Thank you.